Okay, good, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, nice to see you all. Um, well, see some of you and uh, to see everyone else who's joined. I've followed the normal format of uh, muting everyone, and uh, obviously, please, please feel uh, free and uh, able to um, unmute yourselves if you so wish. Um, I should have actually, uh, maybe I'll just post the link to the um, um, to the, the source sheet. I don't know if everyone managed to see on time the uh, um, see on time the uh, download on time the source sheet. I'll just post it in the chat. Um, if anyone hasn't yet managed to download it, I'll just put it there, and you can see the, uh, the source sheet. So uh, today's topic, um, I wanted to look at uh, a theme. Um, really, the, the flow of events in our Pasha, in Pasha's Baloscha. Um, I called this year Pasha's Baloscha, the journey of the upside down nuns, because of course, um, the upside down nuns are at the center of the uh, center of the Sedra, um, the very famous symbols, which I'll explain about in, in a few moments. Um, I see that I forgot to put nuns in italics. So um, I hope um, people didn't see the source sheet and think this was going to be a share about upside down nuns, which of course is a completely different uh, topic. Um, but this share, I assure you, is not about upside down nuns, it's about upside down nuns. Um, so let's get to work and uh, try and understand uh, this, this very strange element of the, or feature of the Sedra. And uh, we'll try and focus on that as normal for about half an hour and then switch to halacha for the, uh, for the second half an hour. So uh, I try to use the handout to give a sense of the flow of the sedra. Um, because Baloscha is, is um, rich in um, incidents and stories, um, I, I think it qualifies as, as perhaps the easiest parsha to give a, a sermon on, to give a drasha on. Um, there's so many uh, aspects to the sedra, so it's just quite remarkable. Um, but let's have a look at um, one um, element of this, or, or a flow of elements in the sedra. So in source one in the source sheet, and again, I, I, put the, um, I put the source sheet in the chat group for those who haven't managed to, uh, to see it. Um, I, I start off going through the incidences that occur. So in Perak Yud, Pasuk Lamad Gimel, um, the narrative starts, and it describes um, actually the journey away from Har Sinai. Now you may wonder what on earth um, are we doing talking about Har Sinai over here? It's true we just celebrated Shavuos, that's in the calendar cycle of the year. But in the reading of the Torah, I mean, Hasinai was all the way back in Yisro, um, more than a, a Sefer and a half ago. Um, since Yisro, a lot has happened. We've built the Mishkan, we've had the whole of Sefer Vayikra, we've had um, the beginning of Bamidbar, Bamidbar also. Why are we now talking about traveling away from Hasinai? And the answer is that the Jews are still camped at Hasinai. They've got the Torah in Yisro, but then a number of things happened, including the Egel Hazav, including the incident of the golden calf, including the building, the mitzvah of the building of the Mishkan, which completes Sefer Shemos. And then Sefer Vayikra is the description of the ritual of the Mishkan, the service in the Mishkan in the Beis HaMikdosh, the Karbonos, and how the sacrifices should be brought. But Midbar then opens with a new census conducted in uh, the Midbar of the Jewish population, and the description of the packing and unpacking of the Mishkan, and a final description of the inauguration offerings of the Mishkan. And now, mid Baloscha, it's finally time to travel on in the desert. So Baloscha really restarts the narrative section of the Torah, after the narrative paused in uh, with the story of the giving of the Torah and the Egel Hazav, and it paused to uh, describe the building of the Mishkan and the uh, service of the Mishkan, and now we're back to narrative, they travel from Hasinai. So Vayisu Mehar Hashem, Derech Shalosh Yomim. They travel from mountain of God, Hasinai, um, a journey of three days. The Aram Bris Hashem Nefneim, and they travel with the Oren. Then we get to Pasuk Lamate, which has the unique um, feature of these upside down nuns, um, brackets, effectively. Vayhi bin Soa Oren, Vayoma Moshe. When the ark travels through the desert, Moshe says, Kuma Hashem When the Oren travels through the desert, Moshe used to daven, he used to um, request of Hashem that um, he should protect us from our enemies and ensure that when we um, travel, we are not under 
um, threats, we're not in danger. Moshe would say, arise, Hashem, let your enemies, your foes be scattered, and those who hate you um, should, be, should flee, should uh, run away. Of Anuchima, and in turn, when the Oran rested, when it arrived in its new destination, he would say, Shuv Hashem, Rivos al Israel, rest Hashem amongst the tens of thousands and thousands of the Jewish people. Then there's another um, continuation of the episode. We now move into chapter 11. This is the next Pasuk in the Torah after Vayib and Tzaron. Vayihi Ha'om Kemisoninim. The people were like complainers. The Kemisoninim, they behaved as complainers. Rabba Ozni Hashem, evil in the ears of Hashem. Vayishma Hashem, Hashem heard their complaints. Vayich Ha'apo, his wrath, his anger burned. Vativa Bohem, Bom Eish Hashem, Vatoful, Bixia Machna, a fire burns amongst the people and consumed the edge of the camp. Vayitzaka Omel Moshe, the people cried out to Moshe, Vayispal El Moshe Hashem, Vatishka Eish, and Moshe Davant, and the fire um, went down, died down. Vayit Hashem, Amakamu, Tavera, and that place was named Tavera. Kivara Vom Eish Hashem, because the fire of Hashem burned against them. Then we have the next Pasuk, Pasuk Dalad, Vahasafsuf Asher Bekibo, His Avu Taiva. The uh, riffraff, the rabble that were amongst them, um, longed a longing, lusted a lusting. The Yashuru Vayivku Gamene Israel, and even the Jewish people got drawn into this and also cried again. Vayomu Miachelon Abasa, we need meat, we want to be fed meat, it's not enough to have the, the mon. Zachana Es Hadogash and Nochal in its rhyme, Chinam, we remember the fish that we could eat free. In Egypt, as a kashuim, as a ratichim, the as ha chotzim, as a sonim, as a shumim, the delicious vegetables we could eat there, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. We remember the excellent foods in Egypt. The atar nafsheni yavesha in kol built on a mon einenu. Now we have nothing. We dried out. All we have is the mon. The mon is miraculous bread, but we want the meat and fish stews that we could have in Egypt. By the way, um, for many years, I, I always found this. Um, a little incongruous, this complaint. I mean, we understand that this complaint is inappropriate. They're being fed the mom. They're not going to starve in the desert. It's one thing when you complain about a lack of water or food because you have nothing. But once you have the mom, why are you complaining about a lack of um, uh, food just because you need the meat? The complaint's also incongruous because there were slaves in Egypt. So fine, you know, you're saying we missed the food, but what about the, um, the slavery? But what always puzzled me when I read this complaint was are, are slaves really fed? You know, fish stew and meat stew, is this really the case? Um, we talk about the lechem only, the bread, only the bread of affliction, the matzah that they had in Egypt. So I understand the complaint is wrong. I understand it's inappropriate. I understand it's also distorted because there were slaves in Egypt. But what are these meat and fish stews that they're longing for? Um, I was given a, a gift by uh, someone recently um, uh, about some of the archaeological research and documentation about what we know about ancient Egypt and the slave conditions there. And in reading the book, I discovered that indeed, um, slaves used to be exceptionally well fed in Egypt. And they found uh, considerable archeological remains in the slave uh, settlements in Egypt of indeed fish and meat stews. The Egyptians believed in feeding their slaves well in order to get um, good work out of them, to keep them healthy. It was a considered an efficient um, economic investment. Um, the matzah, the association with slavery and matzah was a particular phenomenon which I've discussed on other occasions that leavened bread in Egypt was considered a, a luxury, it was the high tech of the time, fed to the um, free individuals and the ruling classes. So that's the, the role of matzah. In general, actually, the Egyptians fed their slaves well, hence um, it gives us, it illuminates us this complaint. Um, obviously, this is a warped complaint, um, distorting uh, the context of the past and uh, just talking about the food and not uh, the, the slavery endured in Egypt. Nonetheless, their, their complaint is historically and technically accurate that indeed, while, when they were in Egypt, they were indeed um, well fed. So this is the complaint of the lust for the food. I want to also point out, because this is often missed in the speed of Kriya Satara, that this is different to the first three Pasukim. There's two incidences that occur here. Incident number one is chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3, Aleph, Beis, and Gimel, Perik, Yod, Aleph, in which we're not told what their complaint is. They were 
um, complainers, evil in the eyes of Hashem, who complains about something, a fire came and burned the edge of the camp, and then the fire subsided when Moshe governed. Pasuk 4 and on refers to a specific set of complaints led by the rabble, presumably um, the Erev Rav, or perhaps the Erev Rav, um, in which everyone else joins in. It's his Savu Taiva, evocative phrases. They lusted a lusting for meat. They longed for the luxury of the foods at the stews of Egypt. And then Pasuk 31 to 35 um, continue the story. What's the response to um, their complaint. There's a large gap here of Pesukim I cut out in which it talks about the leadership that Moshe took in place. That's not going to be the subject of um, this week's uh, shir, the appointment of the Shivim Zakanim, the 70 elders, to facilitate Moshe's leadership. But the response to their complaint is that Pesuk 31, Pesuk Lamadalaf in the source sheet, a wind blows and it carries quail. V'ruach nosom eis Hashem by Yogos Slavim min hayom. It brings in a uh, um, Slav, it brings in uh, quails from the sea, and um, these quails provide vast uh, quantities of meat, and the Jews feast on this meat, but are punished for their greed. Pasuk Lama Dalet, Pasuk 34, that place is named the Graves of Lusting. Gishon Kovres Ha'om HaMisav, because there they buried the people who were lusters, who were consumed by their greed. Again, a very evocative time of phrase, to be buried in a grave of lust. So this is the sequence of Sukkim in the Sedra, the sequence of narratives. And again, we're probably not going to have time to go on, um, but just to remind you, the continuation of the story is the famous episode of Miriam speaking about Moshe and um, uh, um, also the, uh, uh, the story of the, the appointment of the Zakanim, the elders, and Miriam speaking about Moshe. I think things which we've discussed in, uh, as far as I remember from my notes in previous years, um, we've looked with care at these incidences. Now what's going on with the sequence of stories? And in particular, what are these upside down nuns surrounding Vayihi bin Soa Orun, this verse that speaks about the traveling of the Ark? Um, so I called this year, as I said, the journey of the upside down nuns, because uh, I, I, this is a, a sequence of upside down nuns that is meant to indeed take us on a journey. So what do we know about these upside down nuns? So at the bottom of page one in source two, I brought the, the Gemara and Shabbos that addresses this issue. Um, the Gemara speaks about this and gives two explanations of the role of the upside down nuns, neither of which is, is particularly clear. It's not. Uh, um, that's obvious what exactly the Gemara means in its answer. And the first answer the Gemara gives is Pasha Zu, Tonu Abonon, Vayibin Zoran, Vayom Moshe. The, the rabbis discussed this Pesukim of Vayibin Zoran. Pasha Zu, this Pasuk, also this section of Torah, also our Kodesh Baruch Simonios, Milamal Alamata. Hashem made for them Simoniot, um, Simonim, signs, brackets, indicators, the upside down ones, minimal or matter, above and below, in other words, at the beginning of the section and at the end of the section. Why? Loma she'en zumakoma, to say that this isn't its place. To Tanya, and then it brings a price, a rabbin shimmam gamli alomer, a seed of parsha zu shatakum ikam v'tachatu bimkoma. One day this parsha will be uprooted from here and returned to its place. Very fascinating Gemara. Veloma kosvakan, so why was it written here? in order to interrupt between the first punishment and the second punishment. Okay, so what's the Gemara saying over here? The Gemara is saying that this section, these verses of Ayyub and Sarah, are written out of place. And that's what the brackets are there to indicate. Why are they written out of place? To interrupt between a sequence of punishments. In other words, we've just read a very depressing sequence of incidences that occur. Uh, a series of negative behaviors, and this Pasha is put in place to interrupt these sequences of negative behaviors. Finally, the Gemara tells us that one day, sometime in the future, the part, perhaps when Moshiach comes, the Pasha will be uprooted and put back in its place. So lots of questions spring to mind over here. Why is this Pasha out of place? Where should it have been? Why would it be put back in the future to the correct place? Will Sifri Torah be rewritten? And what's exactly the sequence of events that it's interrupting? I mean, if we look at the sequence of events, before Vayahib and Zorah, nothing negative seems to happen. 
All it describes is the journey of the Jews from Sinai. It's after by Yibin Zoran that these negative events happen, they're complaining, they're miserable, the fire comes out, they lost the meat. There's nothing that happens beforehand. So what is this sequence of negative events? And if there is a sequence of negative events, how exactly does it help interrupting the narrative with Vayyibin Zoran? I mean, the sequence of negative events is a fact of history. What does it do to interrupt the narrative by putting some Pesukim in between? But this is the first answer of the Gemara. The second answer of the Gemara is even more difficult. And this is the bottom line on page one. Rebbe, Omer, Rebbe says, The reason for the interruption of the Pesukim with these brackets, rounds by Yehub is to teach us to make us aware this is its own book of the Torah. It's considered a safer by itself. I always thought there were Hamisha Chumshe Torah. There were five books in the Torah, Bereshis, Shemos, Vayikra, Bamidbar, Tvarim. No, in fact, there's a sixth book, Vayibin Samaran, embedded, immersed in another book. So Sefer Bamidbar, which is its own Sefer, its own book, one of the Hamisha Chumshe Torah, one of the five Chumashim of the Torah, in fact, has embedded in it, immersed in it, surrounded in it, a very small, independent, sixth safer of the Torah, which is Vayahi bin Sawa Aron, two Pesukim safer. So what on earth does that mean? Why is there a short um, safer, independent of itself, separate from the rest of the Torah, surrounded by brackets? What's the nature of this safer? But that's the second answer the Gemara gives. So this is all somewhat of a mystery, very uh, strange um, section of Torah and a, 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 a strange Gemara to explain it. So the, uh, the answer basically I want to share in the uh, remaining time available for this part of the shir is um, more or less um, based on an idea of uh, Rav Soloveitchik, um, who, who discusses this um, uh, this, um, this, this sequence of, uh, of Pesukim and these Gemaras and, and gives a very beautiful reading of it. Um, so first of all, where is this middle um, Pasuk sequence of Pesukim of Ayyib and Sar Orin? Where was it meant to be? The Gemara says it's out of place. Um, why here is it, why is it mentioned here if it's out of place and where should it have been? I see that David posted in the chat, he says, if the Gemara here indicates that um, this Pasha is out of place, why doesn't it always indicate? Evidently, there are no other Pashas out of place. Now, it is true that in Muktam and Mu'ukha the Torah, Rashi sometimes believes the Torah doesn't go in temporal order, it doesn't go in line with the passage of time, but then it goes with a different structure. It, it goes with a conceptual structure or a thematic structure. There's another logic to why it, it, um, the events described in the Torah don't go with the passage of time, but they are still in their correct place. They're not in the correct place in the passage of time, but then the correct place conceptually in how the Torah is constructed, is crafted. Here, the Gemara seems to be saying it's completely out of place. It's, it's, it's in an illogical place. It, there isn't a conceptual or temporal reason why it should be there. But then we're stuck in a paradox. Then that begs the question. If indeed it's out of place, then why is it there? And if there's an explanation for it being there, then it's not out of place again. So what's the Gemara say? It is out of place, but it's surrounded by brackets in order to ensure that we know it's out of place. So the deliberate, provocatively placed in the wrong place, and it is out of place, and yes, it's correct for it to be out of place, but one day the Sefer Torah will have to be rewritten. In the future, the Sefer Torah will have to be rewritten, and then it will have to be put back in its correct place. So when Moshiach comes, that's uh, presumably what La'osid um, uh, means, um, we'll have to, Asida in the future, um, we'll presumably have to rewrite our Sifri Torah, we'll have to order that section of the Torah to be rewritten and it to be put in the right place. Now, where would have been the right place for it to have been written? So in source three, I uh, cited from the Baal HaTurim. Um, the Baal HaTurim is, uh, was written by Rabbi Yaakov ben Reb Osha. We're talking about a, uh, a, a Rishon um, amongst the later Rishonim. Um, he's the author, the son of the Rosh, Rabbi Osha, and the author of a, 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 a very, very primary halachic work in his own right, the Arba Turim. But he also wrote a short commentary on the Torah, and particularly famed for the fact that he uses numerology, gematria, um, a lot of the time. Um, now, the Bala Turim discusses where the correct location for this should have been, and he says in line with many of the other Mepharshim, 
that it should have been um, at in Sefer Bamidbar, the beginning of Bamidbar. The beginning of um, Bamidbar, or even um, earlier perhaps, is a description of how the Midbar, how the Mishkan, I'm sorry, was packed up and how it was transported through the desert. Um, in Bamidbar, if you remember, we learned how the encampments were designed with the Levium on all the different sides, allowing the travel through the desert. Now that would have been the place for the description of the travel of the Oran to have occurred. It describes the whole sequence, which tribes followed which tribes, how they were ordered, and in the middle, the Oran was carried along with some of the other Kadim, the other utensils of the Mishkan. And that is the place where the um, description of the Oran's travel should have been uh, placed. And indeed, the Balaturim sees a symbolism in the upside down and nuns being used, because he says, if you do the count, this is 50 parshas earlier. The gematria of Nun is 50. It's indicating shift this parsha 50. Which way should I shift it, forwards or backwards? Well, that's why it uses an upside down Nun. Now, there's not a Nun the right way up to signal shift it in the direction of the flow of script, but there's an upside down Nun to sh signal shift it in the reverse direction of the script, script shift it back 50 parshas, and you will get to the correct location of these sukkim. Okay, so this is the um, where it should have been. Why is it out of place to interrupt between Peronius and Peronius, to interrupt between trouble and trouble? Now, if we go back to page one and look at the sequence of troubles that occur after this bracket of the upside down nun, indeed, troubles occur. They complain, the fire comes out, they complain about the mon and the quail happens, etc. Beforehand, it's quite innocuous. All the post successes, they left Sinai. They traveled away from Sinai. So what's, what's bad about that? So the Ramban on the Pasuk in Source 4 tells us, and it's not really the Ramban's reading, it's based on a Medrash, on an Agata, that the problem is how they traveled away from Har Sinai. They didn't travel with a longing, looking over their shoulder, um, realizing that we're moving on to the next stage, but they ran away from Har Sinai with great gusto and joy and delight in the beautiful language of Chazal, because with the joy of a tinok habereach mebeis ha like a tinok, like a child running away from school at the end of the school day. You ever watch kids leaving the school day, leaving school? They dash out, they've had enough. They're, they're, you know, the day is long, they're exhausted. It's time to dash home and um, finish their studies. The Jewish people traveled, the Israel traveled away from Har Sinai, over enthusiastically. Um, the nuance of language that the Medrash seems to be picking up on is the description of Har Sinai as Har Hashem, the mountain of Hashem. They're not just traveling by Yisimei Har Chorev or by Yisimei Har Sinai, which refers to a journey away from the geography, the geographical location, but it's a travel away from God heights. Har Hashem, God Mountain. It's a travel away from the elevated heights of um, connecting to Hashem that they'd previously experienced. Um, and that's why the description given is not that of a geographical journey, but that of a spiritual journey. Why are they so desperate to get away? Shema year before the Maybe we're going to get more mitzvahs. The bell's gone, the school day's ended, not until it's finished. Let's get out of here as fast as possible so that we don't get more mitzvahs. And this is a fascinating and subtle sin in which they have engaged. It's not an overt sin, they, they indeed have to move on. They're not choosing to move on, they've been given the instructions, it's time to travel off to the next stage through the desert. Nonetheless, there's an indication of, of, of a subtlety of something that has gone wrong. There's a nuance of, of a niggle of things not quite being right, not quite being the way they should be. Rather than seeing Torah as a life-changing, life-forming opportunity, instead they see it as a burden, and they slip into childish behavior and flee the burden that's been given. An adult who, who is in, in receiving education doesn't run away at the end of the year. They linger because they appreciate that this is an opportunity. This was a, a choice that I made to, to receive this learning opportunity and it will enrich me and inspire me and um, educate me and I, I want to be part of it. A child who receives education doesn't value the education. They don't understand the purpose of it. And therefore, they, at the end of the day, they run away from it. Khan Yisrael, in running away from Har Sinai, indicate that they haven't appreciated it. They've adopted a, a perspective of Torah as an imposition, a burden, a load, and therefore will run away from it. 
rather than an opportunity and a chance and a privilege and, and an enriching experience, a very subtle failure. It's not a sin, nothing technically has gone wrong, but it indicates a, a subtle perspective. Hence the sequence of events. What happens when they travel? Well, of course, they're negative, they're moaning. Of course, therefore, they complain, as in the next Pasha. They long for food, as in the Pasha afterwards. They're in a negative mindset. They're not in a healthy spot. And therefore, by Yehib and Sarah is put in between. It's a sort of a, a, a break and a divide in the flow of the Pesukim between the cause of everything that goes wrong, which is a subtle failure, there's no direct sin, um, journeying away from Sinai over-enthusiastically, which then unfolds into the sequence of events, which is one depressing episode after another. And the truth is, if we continue safer by Midbar, it makes pretty bleak um, reading. Baloscha leads to Shalachacha, the sending of spies, which leads to Korach, which leads to Mei Meriva. Unfortunately, the rest of the narrative of Safer by Midbar is one failure after another. Again, it's a little bit beyond the scope of today's year, but whilst Shemos up to the Egal Azav is this journey upwards, but Midbar is, is very much gives this image of, of weariness and decline and failure. There's an exhaustion about the Jewish people. First indication of exhaustion is because they're finding their lot burdensome. Why are they finding it burdensome? Because they see mitzvahs as a burden rather than as something to be embraced. And therefore everything else follows on from that. And somehow or other, all of that is broken up by the description of the journey of the Oren, surrounded by these symbolic nuns, there to indicate that they're out of place, but one day it'll be back in its right place. And this is a safe for Bifnei Atzmo. So you have thought of H it very beautifully, that what we're learning over here are two Sephorim, the Sefer Bamidbar and the Sefer Vayihi bin Sarah Oren. Sefer Bamidbar is a narrative. It's the narrative of the actual physical journey that the Jewish people took. A narrative of one depressing incident after another through the Midbar. But there's an alternative Sefer, embedded in Sefer Bamidbar. And this is a different journey that could have happened, should have happened, is still happening beneath the surface, and will one day be revealed as a different journey that took place. And this is the journey of the Oren. This is the journey of the Holy Ark of Hashem. This is the idealized, theoretical, model journey that should have taken place. The journey in which we travel through following the Oren, that contains the Luchos and the Torah, and we journey elevated, lifted, carried by the Oren, with the distractions, the enemies, the haters, moved to the side of Anuchi Yom Hashem, with the divine presence resting amongst us. So there's the real journey that takes place, the material journey that takes place. That's one Sefer. But says the Gemara, there's another Sefer, a very short Sefer, an alternative Sefer by Midbar which consists of two simple basukim. We journey through, along with the Oren, carried and elevated by the Oren, led by Moshe, protected from our enemies, aware of the presence of Hashem in our camp, with the Shekhinah resting upon us, and this is the alternative Sefer Bar This is the book um, uh, bracketed by the Pesukim, by the, the, the nuns. This is the alternative journey that could have taken place. But this journey is out of place. It's a separate book, and it isn't written in the right place. It's written being Peronos the Peronos. It's written between one disaster and another disaster. It's not written in the real description of the travel of the Jewish people at the beginning of our midbar, because sadly this journey never took place. It's written in parallel, hopefully interrupting, hopefully inspiring, hopefully reminding and encouraging us of the alternative journey that could have taken place. And it all starts going wrong when we leave Har Sinai, not carrying with us the divine presence, not enthusiastically that great now is the start of our new life with Torah Mitzvahs, with a burden, we just need to get away from the school. We've been in school too long, given too many mitzvahs. So if I hear Ben Sa'orin describes another journey, the depressing news is, it's the journey that didn't take place, instead say for Bar took place. The good news is, it really is the journey that's also taking place. Because of course the Oren is still traveling with us. Of course the journey that Hashem wants to take place is still taking place. Of course, ultimately, the model of how Hashem wants the world to be run will happen. Ultimately, the journey of the Oren will occur. However, unfortunately, we've gone on a not-so-brief detour in the process. It's taking us a long time. When will the Pasha be put back in the right place? Not also in the future. Please, God, there will yet again come a time 
when the pasha will be restored to its right place, where this will be the description of history. But in the meantime, unfortunately, we're on a different journey. In the meantime, we read Vayib and Zoran, we remind ourselves that there's another journey taking place, a more subtle experience happening. It's the journey of the Oran. We live and we walk through time in two parallel journeys. The overt journey, the description of a messy and complicated world we live in, with challenges, with difficulties, personal, national, where we don't always see our enemies being scattered, external enemies and internal enemies, where we don't always live in accordance with our best values, where we don't experience the presence of the divine amongst us. But we should know with confidence and certainty that in parallel there's another journey taking place. It's bracketed, it's hidden, it's out of place. By Yehibin Oren. We are still experiencing the journey, Lauren. It just will take longer to unfold, more complicated, through a lot of pain, through a lot of diversion, through a lot of effort. But ultimately, we'll get there. And this is the beautiful and profound message in this Pasha. In the middle of the promise, just when Sefer by Yikra starts its narrative, restarts its narrative, things get off to a messy start. The next Pasha straight after Lauren are one depressing episode after another. The complaints, the fire, the slav, the quail, the complaints about the mong, shlachachah, the maradlin, kurach, the rebellions. But there's one incident that takes place for it. The first narrative of Bamidbar is they left Egypt, they left Tarsinai, and they left Romney, they left enthusiastically, rather than carrying the Torah with them. At that point, the two Sephorim diverge. Sefer A, a short Sefer, two Pesachim by Yim and Sarah Sefer B, the real Bamidbar that happens. But the second Sefer, the hidden Sefer, is still there. It's embedded in Bamidbar. It's still taking place. We're still part of that Sefer. It's still being written and ultimately being put back. This is the beautiful message of our Salajik. I think it has a Musa in it. It has a lesson in it, something else to think about whenever we go on our journey. Is this our journey or is this the orange journey? And it also has a chizuk in it, it has an inspiration. Because we should know that when we go on this journey, when we're living in a complicated and messy and troubling and difficult and challenging world, there is another journey going on. That's of the Oran on the upside down lens traveling along. So that's the uh, thoughts on the Pasha that I wanted to share today. Um, I will stop here the Pasha section of the Shir and we will um, move on to the Halachic section of the Shir where we're looking at Bishal cooking on Shabbos. And um, through no one's fault, um, we've, we've tarried a little bit too long on our journey in Bishal. Um, it's been more interrupted than originally our plans, but I, I, I hope that we will be able to get through this. And I, I sincerely hope and pray that what is a potentially very complicated area of halacha, I will succeed in, um, in, in conveying in a simple and clear manner, because we are now entering into perhaps the, the, one of the most confusing aspects of Hilkos Shabbos. So I will remind you of where we are up to. We spoke about Bishal and Shabbos. Um, we, we reviewed briefly the halachas, but in brief, we're not allowed to cook on Shabbos, whether that's cooking a solid to make it edible or heating up um, a liquid to make it hot. What about reheating on Shabbos? So we discussed that as far as Torah law is concerned, once food is cooked, ain bishal bishal, one is allowed to reheat it because it is ready cooked. Once food is fried or baked, we are allowed to refry it or rebake it because it is already baked, already cooked. We discussed in the last year, um, if something is baked, maybe you can't cook it and boil it because that's a substantive change in the nature of the cooking or baking that it's been through. If something is cooked and boiled, perhaps you can't bake and fry it because that changes the quality of the cooking. But if it's boiled, you can reboil. If it's baked, you can rebake. If it's fried, you can refry as far as Torah law is concerned because nothing substantial is happening. It's already cooked, it's already baked. It may even actually improve a little bit by baking it further. Nonetheless, it's crossed the critical threshold from raw to cooked, and therefore I'm allowed to recook it as far as Torah law is concerned. And uh, this is the halacha with solid. When it comes to liquids, we saw that things are a little more complicated. A liquid which has cooled down has to some degree lost the cooking process that has occurred. And according to the Shulchan Aruch, I cannot reheat it now because that is like a new cooking process and such as the Psak for Sephardim. According to Ashkenazim, the Ramah believes the core halacha is that even with liquids that have cooled down, one can reheat them. Nonetheless, the Ramah says we should be stringent if it has cooled down completely. But if some of the heat lingers, then one can make it hotter, reheat it even on Shabbos and do not need to be concerned with Bishal. 
This is what we discussed last time, and I, I'm not going to review all those halachas of Bishul, Acha, Bishul, as far as Torah law is concerned. But the summary that's important to us is cooking something that was raw and making it edible is Bishul as far as Torah law is concerned. Once it is cooked, recooking it as far as Torah law is concerned, unless it's a substantial change in the nature of the food, is permitted. However, rabbinically, things are a little bit more complicated. And there's a number of layers of drabonon that we need to think about when we wish to cook on, um, reheat rather, on Shabbos. And for the interest of clarity, I'm going to divide the next part of the shear into two. The drabonons which are relevant on Erev Shabbos, before Shabbos, and the drabonons which are relevant on Shabbos itself. And broadly speaking, when it comes to preparing food on Erev Shabbos, as far as Torah law, again, is concerned, we should assume, we, we would have assumed, that there are no problems whatsoever. I'm allowed to do what I want before Shabbos. The fact that on Shabbos something will occur, which is a malacha, need not concern me. We do that the whole time. I mean, we light candles on Ere Shabbos. We are, we, in fact, we are, it's a mitzvah drabonon to light candles on Ere Shabbos in order to ensure there's light on Shabbos. And that's not a problem. There's no problem that it's burning on Shabbos. I can't engage in the malacha on Shabbos of lighting candles. We have time switches that cause things to go on and off on Shabbos. No problem. Because I've done everything before Shabbos. So seemingly it should have been a simple matter. I should be able to put food on the flame before Shabbos, such that it then cooks whenever it wishes to do so on Shabbos. And there's no problem because I'm doing everything before Shabbos. Nonetheless, Chazal created an Issa Drabonon called Shehia. Shehia means, as in modern Hebrew, Shehia, Lishot, to leave on. Leaving food on before Shabbos has halachas connected with it. This is one set of rabbinic halachas. A second set of rabbinic halachas, which we are not going to discuss this week, is called chazorah. When food was on the flame and was left on the flame into Shabbos, and I now want to take it off and put it back or put food onto the flame on Shabbos, already cooked, where as far as Torah law is concerned, ain bishul acha bishul, it's cooked, so why can't I reheat it? Nonetheless, there are restrictions to how I can reheat it, that is the topic for next week's shir. But for this week's shir, we're just going to look at shahia, leaving things on before Shabbos in order for them to cook on Shabbos, which as far as Torah law is concerned, should be absolutely fine because I'm doing nothing on Shabbos. And normally what I do on Friday isn't a problem, even though things I affect change on Shabbos. Nonetheless, since I did it all on Friday, it's okay. Nonetheless, there are rabbinic prescriptions, limitations on what I can do on Shabbos. So this is the um, halachas of Shehir. I mentioned, by the way, as an aside, I mentioned lighting candles on Erev Shabbos. It's a quick plug in my Thursday night ladies share. We will be starting a new topic, the topic of the block up, block up Shabbos, lighting Shabbos candles in that mitzvah. Um, it's open to men and ladies, but it's designed primarily as a ladies share. And uh, we will be looking, we've uh, just finished Birch Samoz and Benching last week, and we will be starting Habakkuk's Neo Shabbos on Thursday uh, evenings. Back to our subject, what can I or can I not do on Friday in order to cook um, food such that it could be cooked on Shabbos? So the background to this is a Mishnah in Mesech Shabbos, and the Mishnah says that raw food shouldn't um, be left uncovered over the flame on Shabbos, and even though, as far as Torah law is concerned, I did everything before Shabbos and it should be completely okay, nonetheless, rabbinically, they created a limitation. Why is there a limitation? For obvious reasons, because cooking is not a completely one-off static process. Even after I put the food on the flames, it needs to be constantly monitored and tweaked. And we are worried that in the process of cooking the food, a mom will check and recheck the food to make sure it's cooking properly and adjust the flame. This is what takes place when one cooks. And if one does so, if one adjusts the flame, one may end up either doing bishul, cooking on Shabbos, because I've sped up the cooking process, or mavir, which we discussed in our previous look at Hilton Shabbos, um, lighting, kindling a flame on Shabbos by lighting more fuel. And I will transgress, God forbid, two Torah prohibitions on Shabbos. Therefore, in the role of 
Chazal, they created a fence around the Torah, and they said, don't leave raw food cooking on Ere Shabbos without certain limitations. Now, what are the parameters of this limitation, this prescription, this, this prohibition to leave raw food cooking, and um, how can we do so in a permitted manner? So the first distinction that needs to be drawn out um, will bring us back to our, one of our early conversations in Hilchus Bishel, which is the concept of Machel Ben Drosoy. Ben Drosoy, you'll remember, was the bandit. He um, used to eat partially cooked food, rushed food, fast food, um, only semi-cooked food. And there is a significant argument that really spans the generations as to whether the prohibition on leaving raw food on the flame on Ere Shabbos applies to any food which isn't completely cooked. And the logic of that would be that since the food isn't completely cooked, one may still end up tweaking and stirring and uh, um, uh, changing the flame levels. And therefore any food which isn't mavushal, kol sarko, completely cooked as much as it needs to be cooked. And even if it's fully cooked, but nonetheless, um, it will improve through further cooking. Um, in all those cases, there's a risk of me tweaking at the flames, and therefore I can't leave that such food on, on an uncovered flame on a Friday. So opinion number one is any food which is not fully cooked and reached peak level of cooking should not be left on the flame uncovered because we are worried about the um, person responsible for the food tweaking the flame on Shabbos accidentally. This is opinion number one. Opinion number two says, no, as long as the food is cooked, kamachal vendrosoy, as long as the food is um, cooked to a minimal level of edibility, we're not worried about the risk of tweaking at the flame. The person cooking the food knows the food is, is cooked to a level of edibility. It's let's say half cooked or a third cooked, such that it is edible. And one is already now calm, one's not panicking about food not being edible for Shabbos. So it's true people continue to tweak the flame until something is completely cooked. Nonetheless, the pressure is off and they will remember that it's Shabbos. They won't be caught up in, in the cooking process such that there's a risk of forgetting that it's Shabbos. And therefore, as long as food is partially cooked, um, one doesn't need to have the flame covered. We don't worry about cooking on an uncovered flame and adjusting the flame. So this is the first and uh, perhaps most important distinction. The prohibition of cooking, leaving food cooking before Shabbos, as far as Torah law is concerned, shouldn't be a problem because I'm putting it on before Shabbos and it gets cooked on Shabbos, who cares? Rabbinically, they said, leaving uncooked food on a flame that can be adjusted on Shabbos is a problem. Does it mean uncooked food even where it's 95% cooked till it's completely cooked? Or does it mean as long as it's crossed a basic level of cooking, machal ben drosoy, partially cooked? Now, how do we pasken in this debate? Um, very fascinatingly, this debate continued throughout Jewish history. Um, it started off in the period of the Mishnah, it continued through the Gemara, continued through the Rishonim and down to the Achronim of the 20th century. It's a halachic debate that continued really across the whole extent of the history of the oral Torah of Torah Shmalchah. But the core halacha is that the Shulchan Aruch seems to be stringent and say that you need a blech as long as something is not fully cooked. The Ramah, who Paskans Vashkenazim, seems to be lenient and say, says as long as it is partially cooked, a third or a half cooked, one can be lenient. And as I said, later Achronim continued to debate this matter. Nimish Nebrua says, nonetheless, we should be machme, we should be stringent, and should only allow fully cooked food. The Chazanish says, no, it's enough as long as it's partially cooked. Sephardim, who ostensibly one would think should be stringent, like the Shulchan Aruch. Many Sephardim have the custom to be lenient, like the Ramah, and it remains, excuse the pun, a hot topic to this day. It remains uh, not a, uh, a really resolved halachic matter completely. So what does one do in practice? Well, good kitchen policy is therefore that if one does not have a blech, the food should be completely cooked before Shabbos. So if you wish to leave food on an uncovered flame, the food should be completely cooked before Shabbos. If you, it's not completely cooked, use a blech. 
if for some reason or other you end up somewhere without a blech and you're running late and Shabbos starts and food is only partially cooked, well, as long as the food is half cooked or a third cooked, one can rely on the lenient opinions that say, as long as the food is still significantly cooked, you already don't need a blech. It's a little hard to measure what a third or a half cooked exactly means. Um, one would need to do quite a complicated calculation of uh, the full length of the cooking time and then uh, what's half of the, the cooking time. It's actually not such a simple calculation to make. But if the food is, is, ba is, is basically edible, even though it's not fully cooked, the chatzchila one should still have a blech. But if one is stuck and doesn't have the blech, the, it isn't covered, one, should, um, one is okay if it is at least basically edible. So this is really the conclusion of the Psak Kaloch in this area. As we've mentioned, there is a Jurabonon not to use an uncovered flame. Um, we should never use an uncovered flame, even if the food is pretty cooked, it's not 100% cooked. But yeah, as long as the food is basically cooked, that's enough to use an uncovered flame. Having said that, the general advice is to always have food fully cooked before Shabbos. And I'll explain to you why. Because if food is not fully cooked before Shabbos, leaving aside the pros and cons of covering it and a blech and all those complexities of drabonon, the reality is the food's not fully cooked. And if I speed up the cooking process, I will have transgressed Shabbos. How could I speed up the cooking process? Well, even something as minimal as moving the pot slightly nearer or slightly further away from the flame. So if I have a, a, a blech, let's say, so as we've already explained, once I have a blech, since the fire is covered, this rabbinic prohibition of a worry that I might adjust the flames doesn't apply. And therefore the food doesn't need to be cooked before the start of Shabbat. That is correct. However, it is also true that there may be a hotter and cooler place on the blech. Now, if the food is fully cooked, I don't need to worry about moving it around from a hotter to a cooler place because it's already fully cooked. But if the food is still partially raw and I move it from a cooler to a hotter part of the blech, I could be speeding up the visual cooking process and transgress a Torah prohibition, not even a rabbinic prohibition, a Torah prohibition. So in general, in good kitchen policy, the correct advice is that all food should be fully cooked and avoid these sorts of complications. Nonetheless, as far as core halacha is concerned, I have a choice. Either fully cooked food on an uncovered flame or partially cooked food on a covered flame. And with the avid, even partially cooked food on an uncovered flame. Now, I want to probe in a little bit more detail the second halacha that, refer, that, that is relevant to leaving things on before Shabbos. So again, halacha number one, or definition number one is, um, Chazal were concerned about leaving food on and cooking before Shabbos because of the risk of adjusting the flame. And therefore they said uncooked food shouldn't be left on an uncovered flame on Erev Shabbos. And the first definition we've given is what they mean by uncooked food. Does it mean only where it's completely raw, but if it's basically barely edible, that's enough? Or does it mean it has to be fully cooked? And this is what we discussed. And as we explained, the Chatzchila one should have all food fully cooked before Shabbos. But if the flame is covered, it could be even partially cooked would be enough, or even raw would be enough. Section number two of this, what do we mean by a covered flame and why does it help? So in the times of Chazal, they didn't have stove tops like we have. And they had various sorts of oven. I'm not going to go into the technologies of the different types of ovens. They had a tunnel and a cura, different types of oven. For our purposes, we're just going to talk about a stove at top for now. And we're not going to be talk about ovens at all. Um, and in the times of Chazal, the way they would cover the kira top, where they uh, would sort of partially insert the pot um, in order to cook it, um, they had two solutions to allow you to leave the pot of raw food cooking on Erev Shabbos. Solution number one was called gerufa, um, shoveled out, um, cleaned out, removal of the coals. So basically in an oven, you have coals. If you have coals, there's the risk of you adjusting them on Shabbos as per the fear of Chazal that you'd accidentally adjust the flame on Shabbos. If you remove all the coals, then you won't be able to stir the coals on Shabbos. There's no problem. What would keep the oven hot? Well, the, the walls of the oven maintained heat for hours upon hours. They weren't metal ovens, these were solid stone ovens which reached um, extraordinary heat and would retain the heat. As long as um, extraordinary temperatures and would retain the heat, as long as the oven is, um, is you've swept out the coals, no rabbinic fear of adjusting the temperature. Solution number one. Solution number two 
was called kutuma, kutuma, covered. They would cover the flame with um, ashes, and that would weaken the intensity of the flame. And it would also serve as a reminder and a hecka as a, um, a sort of distinction, so that you would be reminded, oh, it's sharpest today, I better not adjust it. So you would look at the flame, you would worry that your pot's not cooking well. You may forget it's Shabbos and be tempted to shovel the coals to stir up the heat. And then you would notice that all the coals are Shabbos, are, are covered, and you would realize I shouldn't change the temperature. It is Shabbos today. So in the modern stovetop, this is the solution that we adopt. We don't remove the fuel source, that's not practical for us. But what we do is um, remove the cover the flame, or perhaps remove the ability to adjust the flame. Now, there are two, um, when we use the word blech, we use, mean one of two things. Till um, maybe 30, 35 years ago, a blech meant a sheet of metal placed on top of the flame of, let's say, the gas flames on the stove top. And this succeeded in allowing Shabbos, era of Shabbos cooking to take place, leaving things on the flame before Shabbos, because it covered the flame, uh, analogous to Guruf or Kutuma, it slightly reduced the heat, it covered the flame, it reminded one that it was Shabbos, and therefore covering the flame, the gas top, the stove top, with a metal sheet, with a blech, was equivalent to Guruf and Kutuma, and allowed one to leave things cooking on Erev Shabbos. In addition, many of the blechs had an additional flap that also covered the dials or the knobs with which one adjusted the stove top. And this was to be choshesh for a minority opinion, to take into account a minority opinion, that what should be covered isn't the flame, but the adjustable knobs. The reason for this confusion is because in the older days with the coals, the flame was the coal, and the way you adjusted the flame was the coal. So you covered the coal and you covered both the flame itself and the ability to adjust the flame, which was um, the cover that you put on top of the coal. With gas tops, the way you adjust it is with the knob, the dial, and the flame is the flame. So which one should you cover primarily? And therefore the blech was designed to cover both, um, both the flame itself as the sheet across the flame and the little flap or, or um, fold in the blech which covered the dials or the knobs. Core halacha is to cover the flame, but nonetheless we used to cover both in order to take both opinions into account. So this was the solution of the blech, covering a flame. In more um, recent times, um, a second method of warming things up or maybe cooking things on Shabbos has developed, which is the so-called hot plate, which has now also become referred to as a blech. What's the solution of the hot plate? How does the hot plate work conceptually? The answer is it has two important qualities. Quality number one is it doesn't have a heat control. It has one setting, on or off. And since it's non-adjustable in terms of the heat level, um, it would appear to not fall within the criteria of Chazal, which was a fear that you would turn the heat up. Secondly, since it doesn't have a heat control, it generally isn't used as a normal way of cooking, and therefore fulfills the condition of a hekka, a shinoya, a change, as it were, in normal style, which ensures that you will remember it is Shabbos. And therefore, an electric hot plate, which has also now become referred to as a blech, is a second method of warming up food on Erev Shabbos, of heating food over Shabbos, and leaving food cooking on Shabbos. Even though the blech may reach um, proper high temperatures, nonetheless, um, it's not generally considered the normal way of cooking, it's non-adjustable, and therefore one can put food on it on Erev Shabbos. Now, blechs themselves, hot plates themselves, the ones from Israel generally don't reach such a, a strong heat, the ones from America um, reach a, a good heat, I'm sorry, the ones from America generally don't reach such a high heat, the ones from Israel do reach a very high heat, um, from a halachic point of view, according to most poskim, um, with respect to Erev Shabbos, there's no distinction between these different sorts of blechs, and there's no distinction with respect to Erev Shabbos between these hot plates and the old-fashioned blech, the sheet covering the flame. They are all pretty much identical as far as Erev Shabbos is concerned. They are all solutions to leaving food cooking on Erev Shabbos. When we look in future weeks at putting food onto a blech on Shabbos, which is a different thing, not leaving food cooking before Shabbos, but putting food onto a heat source on Shabbos, 
There, there may be distinctions between the old fashioned sheet black and the modern electric hot plate. But for the purposes of Erev Shabbos Friday cooking, um, there aren't really significant halachic distinctions according to most opinions. So this is the concept of leaving food cooking on Erev Shabbos. Um, we have, however, another task ahead of us, um, which is understanding how to adapt these halachas to the inside of an oven. What we've spoken so far about is a stove top. We now need to discuss how to apply these halachas to the inside of an oven. And we also need to discuss how to apply these halachas to an urn, um, a Shabbos kettle, um, which also is another way we leave food cooking from Erev Shabbos into Shabbos. So can one leave food in an oven heating on Erev Shabbos and taken out on Shabbos? And how can one leave food in an urn on Erev Shabbos in order to have hot water on Shabbos? What do we need to look out for when we're buying an urn? And what do we need to look out for as features in an oven that allow one to leave food cooking um, on to, into Shabbos itself? So this will be our topic for next week, a continuation of the halachas of Shafia, of leaving food cooking on Erev Shabbos. And we will look at ovens um, and urns and uh, maybe a little bit more detail about uh, hot plates. Um, so this is uh, where we'll leave things for today. And please God, we'll continue the halachas of um, Shahia from um, Erev Shabbos. Someone has written to me um, here on the side about a hot plate which does have a temperature dial, which has halachic, which has adjustable temperature. I'm going to take that shayla off group um, because it's a little bit more complicated. But I would say when you set out to buy a hot plate, um, certainly we will choose a hot plate that has non, uh, that isn't um, adjustable. Um, so I'll stop there unless anyone wants to ask any questions. And uh, once again, I thank you all so much for uh, joining and I wish you all a, a good evening. Sure.